Hello and welcome to What's the Story Ghost? I'm your host Annette. And I'm Stephen. And today we are on episode 22. Stephen. Annette. Have you ever been to Kilmainham Jail? Not that jail, no. Not, wait, what? Cork City Jail. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> museum you know, jails. Ja- museum jail, jails. You, that's a museum jail. Kilmainham's a museum jail mm-hmm. now. So that's what we're going to discuss today. Uh, neither of us has been. So if anyone has any personal experiences, it'll definitely be interesting to... Uh, Hear them. Yeah, and convince us maybe to possibly go. Yeah, I'm we totally should go. Yeah. Send us a voicey on Instagram, did or did we do machine. <laughs> okay. I'll do the I'll do the talking now. It's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, we crack on? Crackity crack. It's pitch black in here and it's freezing. There's one candle that's supposed to do us for light and heat, and it's not doing either of those things. I'm lying on the floor trying to pretend I'm asleep. Good thing and all though, because I managed to find out through the whispers who the other people are that are in the cell that I'm in. Two of them were in here for murder, but they said they didn't do it. I don't know what self-defense means, but they look shifty. One is in for burglary. Said he was desperate, needed to feed his wife so she could feed their new baby, you know? The nice lady beside me was in for being intoxicated. I can't say the word, but I think it means drunk. She said that she was just trying to stay warm and whiskey helps or something. My mum hates the smell of whiskey now that I think of it. And then there's me. I'm James. My mates call me Jimmy. I'm seven and three quarters. I got caught robbing an apple. A bleeding apple! I never usually get caught. I was so hungry. And I know it's wrong, but my dad drinks all our money and my ma's always crying and I was just hungry. A bleeding apple! Five in a cell. How can they put five of us in here? There's barely enough room to breathe. I don't think I'll be sleeping tonight though. Everyone's being all buddy buddy, but I don't even trust a nice lady. Can't believe I'm in here. But I get food in jail, so it can't be all that bad, right? Although little Jimmy is completely fictitious, his story is not unlike the conditions of the jail, which we will cover today. When it was first built in 1796, Kilmainham Jail was called the New Jail to distinguish it from the old prison it was built to replace. I say prison, but it was a putrid dungeon, and only a few metres away from the present site. It was officially called the County of Dublin Jail, and it was originally run by the Grand Jury of County Dublin. Kilmainham Jail is Ireland's answer to Alcatraz. From very early on, a variety of criminals, from murderers to Irish rebels, as well as women and children convicted of small crimes, were sent to Kilmainham Jail. As little Jimmy said in his whispers, there was no separation in the cells between the men, women or children, or the categories of crimes they were jailed for. Sometimes five in a cell, with just one candle for lighting, and that one candle would only be replaced once a week, so they had to make do. There were no pleasant prisons in the early days, but Irish ones in particular were ill-funded due to the political situation at the time. The English powers treated the inmates horribly. It seemed the English wanted to set an example for anyone thinking about going against them, and it seemed to do just that. The front of the jail had a set of gallows, and hangings were done in public view quite regularly. However, from about 1820 onwards, very few hangings, public or private, took place in Kilmainham. But not none. A small hanging cell was built in the prison in 1891. It's located on the first floor between the East Wing and the West Wing. This was also one of the prisons where older inmates who were convicted of more serious crimes were often shipped off to Australia, though the ones who committed the most horrific offences were taken to the hanging room. For some reason, female prisoners were treated much worse than men. A report from an inspector in 1809 claimed how the women's block was much more overcrowded than the men's, with the men sleeping on iron bedsteads while the women had to lay on nothing but straw. Remarkably, for an age that prided itself on a protective attitude for the weaker sex, the conditions for female prisoners were persistently worse than for men. This mistreatment carried on for more than 50 years. Robert Emmett, a rebel leader, was removed from Kilmainham Jail and brought to the place of his execution, opposite St. Catherine's Church in Thomas Street. 
There, he was hung, drawn and quartered in 1803. He was one of the first of many to die in the fight for independence. During his trial, Emmett asked that his grave go unmarked until Ireland was free. Many of the criminals who were confined here died, and perhaps the most eventful was the execution of those responsible for the uprising in Ireland in 1916. The executions were carried out by firing squad at dawn. The men had earlier been tried in secrecy at Richmond Barracks in Dublin at a series of field general court martial where they were permitted no defence counsel. The executions began in the morning of May 3rd with Porrick Pierce, Thomas Clark, the only American citizen among the executed Irish rebels, and Thomas McDonough being shot by firing squad at the Stonebreakers Yard in Kilmainham Jail. Just a tiny paragraph from the letter Porrick Pierce sent to his mother dated the 3rd of May. I just received Holy Communion. I am happy except for the great grief of parting from you. This is the death I should have asked for if God had given me a choice of all the deaths. To die a soldier's death for Ireland and freedom. We've done right. People will say hard things of us now, but later on will praise us. Do not grieve for all of this, but think of it as a sacrifice which God asked of me and of you. The following morning, May 4th, Joseph Plunkett, Edward Daly, Michael O'Hanron and Willie Pierce were shot, followed by John McBride on the morning of the 5th of May. Eamon Kant, Michael Mallon, Sean Houston and Con Colbert were shot on the 8th of May, followed by Sean McDiarmada and James Connolly on the 12th of May. There are reports that Connolly was already grievously ill and was unable to stand in front of the firing squad that shot him. Stark black crosses now mark the place where these deaths occurred. The last prisoner held in Kilmainham was an anti-treaty IRA leader, Eamon de Valera, who years later would serve first as Taoiseach and subsequently President of Ireland. Upon his release, the prison was closed, locked and left to rot by the population who hated even the mention of its name and wanted to forget its injustice, torture and executions. Kilmainham Jail was decommissioned as a prison by the Irish Free State Government in 1924. It was seen as a site of oppression and suffering, and there was no declared interest in its preservation as a monument to national independence. While it was still in operation, Kilmainham Jail became known as a hell on earth. And despite what you think, it wasn't because of the horrendous, inhumane conditions or the torture inflicted by the guards upon prisoners, or even the daily executions, but for the more paranormal terrors that were being rumoured from within its walls. Even prison guards would rather be at any other prison than Kilmainham. Despite the high level of security at the prison, it was near impossible to maintain security. In many cases, guards were engaged in chasing phantom lights and trying to escape corridors that suddenly lost all light. During the 1960s, one of the first hauntings was reported while Kilmainham Jail was undergoing renovations. At this time, the governor, Dan McKill, was stationed at the jail with his family in the old warden's quarters. Late one night, he was looking out over the courtyard when he noticed the lights to the chapel were on. He went out to investigate and found nothing unusual, so he turned the lights off and made his way back up to his quarters. To his surprise, after taking just a few steps, he turned around to see the lights were switched back on. This reportedly happened several times throughout the night. Perhaps the most shocking supernatural incident happened during the same renovation period, when a painter was working in the dungeon. He was pushed right across the room and pinned against the wall by an unseen force. After what he said took a fight to get free, he was terrified, leaving all his equipment there and he never returned. Another common occurrence during restoration was the distinct sound of footsteps, running up to workers and then stopping next to them. Numerous people experienced this and then felt a sudden icy chill come over them when they looked up only to see nothing. Visitors to this day are still experiencing some mysterious paranormal activity. They often report people in period dress to the tour guides, only to learn that they were apparitions. The chapel area gives guides and visitors the creeps, with people often reporting that they feel an evil presence is watching them. 
Several mediums have also reported an evil entity in the chapel during their visits. Other strange occurrences include sudden cold spots, strange noises, disembodied voices and cell doors slamming shut. Royal Hospital Kilmainham is one of my favourite places in Dublin. That's about as close to Kilmainham jail as I'm willing to get. Because I think residual energy is picked up by spiritually open-minded people and I'm afraid that whatever still lives there will sense me coming a mile away. What do you think of that? I had several emotions. <laughs> some of them were patriotic <laughs> and some of them were creepy. That was I could not mention everybody's name. No, there's there's some definitely interesting stories in there. Um, oh, we have to go to Kamehameha Jail. That looks like it's I know. I'm, I'm just terrified the second I get there, they'll just set on me and they'll be like, mm, look, I've won with Yeah, them. but if that happens and you stay there, you're not coming home with me. Yeah, and the way you'd probably look at it is, but this is good footage for the podcast. <laughs> yes, footage for a, an audio podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we'll have to get another he- um, headset and microphone for the ghost. Leave room for the Holy Ghost, though. Uh, um, no, I thought it, it was mad though because I didn't realize how short a time it was open, and I don't mean a short a time. It was, it was what was it, seventeen ninety six to nineteen twenty four. But there's a whole bunch of stuff that happened in such a short space of time, like in 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 the first fifty years, like five to a room. Like I was watching, what was I watching today? The Mountjoy today. Yeah. And one of the cells had three beds in it. So there was yeah. bunk beds. And then there was one other bed that was done in an L shape with the bottom bunk bed. Yeah. Now, I can understand how three people would fit in that room. And that was overcrowded. But these people didn't even have beds. Mm. And there was five put in a room. And I'm like, yeah, little Jimmy's in there with a drunk woman, a thief, and two murderers. Even the murderer is not going to fall asleep that night because there's also somebody mm. else in there as bad as him. Yeah. And I'm kind of like, gee, like seven, Stephen. That, Jimmy is fictitious. A seven-year-old is fact. The youngest person, yeah. the youngest person to be... Incarcerated? Um, with seven. Seven years of age. That's what I, when you were saying you could hear footsteps of somebody running up and then stopping, it reminded me how the boys run up and they stop oh, at the doorstep. Yeah, but it, kind of it could be the kid going, oh, come and play with me. And then he's not there anymore. And then you go like the chili. Do you know what? There's a couple of... Um, it's been in our Waverly episode and it's been in the... Trans Allegheny episode where they bring like uh, ping pong balls or they bring little you know baby football yeah. like beach balls. I think if we went, we could probably we could probably bring a ball with us, leave it on the floor, say nothing, and see if it moves. Just bring the two boys and see if they notice anybody. <laughs> okay, bye, mom. We're going to go play. And I'm like, how many we is in that group? <laughs> you likened it to Alcatraz as well. That's the vibe I got, and it was a quote that I read, and I thought it was very fitting. Yeah, Alcatraz is surrounded by water. Okay, in a business. But not, the only reason I mentioned logistically. The only reason I mention it is because Alcatraz is on one of my swim lists. Or is on my swim bucket list. Oh yeah, that's actually true. I forgot about See, that. There's a, a race called Escape from Alcatraz. I'll tell you what, you go do the swim, the boys and I'll go and do, do a tour, tour. Yeah. And then we'll convene for a hot chocolate afterwards. Cool. Cool. Sounds sounds You like... can tell us if you died or not. And we can tell you if you're gonna be the next episode on the podcast. <laughs> Like I thought it was a good episode. It was. I got a little bit upset when I was reading some of it, uh, but it didn't mention Oliver Cromwell. So you know, yeah. I managed but, to but steer yeah, away from that. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Uh, one thing I did actually find. No, I don't know if I found it right. I don't think I actually found anything out. If I'm being totally honest with you, because I think people do this kind of stuff to make me think I got somewhere with this information. Robert Dennett, hung drawn and quartered. Oh yes. I don't know if he was. He was hung. I don't know if he was quartered. I think what happened was, and what I read, was that he was decapitated and they lifted his head and said, this is the head of a traitor, Robert Emmett. So basically what happened was his body was brought to one location and then it was brought back to Kilmainham. And they said, we will release his remains to whoever comes to claim him. But his own family had been arrested because they associated with him. And Jesus, his maid, God love her, I felt so bad tortured to bits and he begged her and pleaded with her he said i'm doomed just fess up tell them everything they want to know and she was like no no i'm 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 loyal to you and i will stay loyal to you but because they said whoever comes and claims his body half of his family was arrested and the other half were too afraid to come and claim it so he was buried yeah it kind of sounds like that so his body was buried in one place and then sneaky sneaky some of his I don't know who it was. I'm not going to say it was his family members, but someone came and robbed him 
and put him somewhere else and I can't find him. But I did find a report somewhere saying that his head was secretly secretly buried in uh, his mum's kind of ancestral grounds. I think mm-hmm. that was Kerry. I could be wrong. Bally Downey. Yeah, and then they reckon that the rest of his remains are buried in St. Peter's in St. Stephen's Green. That is all the digging up I am doing because I got stuck in a rabbit hole today so, and I couldn't find him anywhere. St. Peter's in Stephen. What? What's that? St. Peter's Church near Stephen's Green. Near Stephen's Green. No, it's not in Stephen's Green. I was Sorry, like, no, that's my bad. There's a cemetery in... Oh, that's what I thought you were telling no, me. No, that's um, supposedly... Supposedly. That word came up a lot today. That's where they reckon he is. But his head is close to his mum. Mm. And there haven't been any tests done on it. But it was found in a mahogany or, or a rich kind of wood box with gold brass kind of clasps and hinges and stuff like that. Um, but they haven't done any tests on it. I know way too much information on where this man's head was found and what it was found in, but it was reburied again where they found it. They just kind of left it be because if they don't know and they can't do tests on it, which they can now, yeah. but if they if they weren't going to do any tests on it, just leave him alone. Let him rest his head and just be still for a while. You know, is there any major characters in this? Or is it just a person in story? I don't know. What you could do is find a little person for my fictitious character, Jimmy, because there was a seven-year-old yeah. who was in the prison. See, I went off on a tangent in my own mind because you were talking about jails and then you went and mentioned Alcatraz. You said it once. <laughs> and you just trailed off. Well, I just trailed off and I was, I was, all basically, uh, I have Sean Connery and Nick Cage here just waiting for part. And I also had James Nesbitt written down here as well because. Am I going to have to tell you about the man who got his ne- nephew's hair cut? And then had oh, to go in. Huffles. No. Yeah. He was in. I don't think James Nesbitt was in Huffles. But he, he brought. It was, this was an ad in the 90s. And he brought his nephew to get a haircut. Because he, he made a, a, a hands of it. And he's in the thing. In the hairdressers. And he's pretending to shout at the woman while his sister's in the car. And he's like, I will pay you double. <laughs> double. To fix the mess. And this child's hair that I've created. Is that not him? No, that's Simon Page. Yeah. You said James Nesbitt. Yes. So why did you put in it? And I said, it's in the, he's not on Hot Wheels. And then you typed <laughs> Hot Wheels into Google. Because I wanted to see what his name was. James Nesbitt. Oh. I mean, he could. He could. be a very distinct accent. He does know. have a very distinct accent, all the same, yeah. Now, you mm. could find someone for Thomas Clark. Mm. You could find someone for Thomas Clark, because he's the only American among them all. Jack Black. Okay, he... I don't know how he would fare out in a period piece, but it would be good. Like Nick Cage is a very versatile actor, but I don't even want to. I don't even want to hear him try no, an attempt yeah, at Irish is. accent. He would butcher it. Who? Jack Black. Nick Cage. Nick Cage. Oh yeah. No, Jack Black. Jack Black is going to play Thomas Clark. Yes, yes, yes. So he just has to do his own accent. So you had thought of. Basically, I just want to. I want to watch Alcatraz again. That's oh my god! You nobody for the. So you literally just went off on one. I was imagining us being going to visit Alcatraz, uh-huh. and then the bad guys came exactly like they did in the film, and we were just the regular punters that were on the tour, and the uh, Alcatraz was shut down, and we were uh, incarcerated, mm-hmm. and then somehow I got talking to Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery, and then I'm on the escape team. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So what did that have to do with my story? It was in Alcatraz. I mentioned Alcatraz once. And I went off the tangent. Do you know why you did? Because the people at home won't know this, but I had to say that sentence three times because I kept getting it all wrong. I, it's a very short so sentence. So if you say Alcatraz into and a mare three times, your husband will go there. Yeah. Time. <laughs> yes. Yes, that is what happened. I don't know if it's the same as today, Rick, but I hope to God that the boys love me enough to write me a letter if they think it's about to go down. Mums get worried about letters being sent. But do, do boys still love their mummies like that? Like, that man loved his mum. And not in a, ah, he loved his mummy. Like, he adored his mum. He was a fantastic writer. She asked him to write her a poem as if it was from her to him. And it's a beautiful poem. I, I, I obviously didn't include it. But it was a really, really beautiful poem. And I was like, oh, my God, to have that much love for your mum. And I have two sons. One of them is bound to at least like me a little they will, yeah. Ah, they write ah, they will, yeah. They, at the very least, they'll write you an email when we send them off. Yeah, that's true. Whatever, travel. But between now and then, I get to enjoy art. 
that they do in school. Oh yeah. We finish up there? Yes. Okie dokie. So if you have any reviews on today's episode or you have any requests for future episodes, you can DM us on our Instagram. It's what's the story ghost. And if you have any personal experiences that you would like to share with us, if you visited any of the places actually that we have mentioned, because some of the last places we've mentioned are places that people can visit, send us on your personal experience at our email, what's the story ghost at gmail.com. And with that being said, exit jingle. <laughs> Bye. Bye.